My guest today is Brian Merrick, the Deputy Director of Service Delivery Staff at DOJ. Brian, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Justin. It's great to be here with yeah. you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. And you know, I know you transitioned over from the State Department actually last uh, September. So tell us a little bit about you know yourself and what you've been up to at DOJ since moving over. Sure. No, I've uh, I've had a fairly varied background on the business side of things. Uh, also, uh, quite a few IT roles. Uh, most of my time at State, I was really focused on modernization and, and cloud efforts. Uh, and as I transitioned into Department of Justice, sort of bring some of, brought some of that expertise with me uh, as we try to continue on that modernization journey that I know so many of us are, are still on. Yeah, absolutely. It's a never-ending journey, right? And I, I know DOJ has a relatively new IT strategic plan kind of covering 2022 through 2024. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your progress against that plan so far and what are some of the big modernization priorities right now? Sure. So as you can imagine, you know, we have quite a few challenges uh, in terms of meeting user expectations and, and mission requirements throughout our space. Um, we have quite a, a diverse set of roles and, and responsibilities and tasks that, that face us. Um, so uh, as we crafted that plan, I think a, a big part of that focus was really making sure that we had a good alignment between you know, what the mission needed in, in order to deliver uh, key goals and objectives uh, and that we had the IT support in place to, to really assist that. So obviously some very key areas around that from a modernization standpoint is continuing on the cloud journey. Um, definitely uh, a lot going on in the, in the data space, um, both in the, the law enforcement side and, and certainly in the, in the legal side. Uh, and with that, making sure that, you know, we're, we're really thinking through how we apply our, our policies and our, our legal concerns uh, around the use of a lot of this technology itself. Of course, you know, there, there are other things emerging in tech that we're also looking at quite a bit, um, you know, as we, we proceed with that. And, you know, we also have other uh, requirements, uh, especially on the law enforcement side around, you know, secure communications and, uh, you know, even radio communication is, is very critical for us. So there are a lot of different spectrums that we're focused on uh, throughout the entire array of our, our strategy. Yeah, it seems uh, like there's there's not just one piece you can really focus on. You've got to have a multi-focus uh, plan there. And, and I noticed goal one of that strategy is enhanced service delivery. So, mm -hmm. of course, I'm, I'm sure you're the guy that's very much in charge of that. You touched on the cloud and how that plays a big role in this strategy. Uh, how, how is DOJ using the cloud today? I'm sure it's similar in some ways to a lot of other agencies with productivity tools like mm -hmm. Office 365, but then there are probably some unique cases. So what's kind of the cloud landscape at DOJ today? Sure, so you know, as you can imagine, uh, it came up as most agencies do where uh, the mission space that was really driving uh, acceleration sort of took out first uh, out of the gate, and then the enterprise caught up, of course, uh, as occurs in most agencies. And so uh, on our particular journey, uh, yes, you're, you're correct, we've got you know, modern collaboration tools in place, uh, you know, and in addition, we also have quite a proliferation of different uh, business applications uh, that are used across uh, various components and, and parts of our organization. So as we've looked at that, we've seen a, a huge explosion in cloud capabilities uh, really tailored towards those real-time computing requirements. Uh, also, you know, things in, in the area of artificial intelligence uh, for specific business needs. Uh, and, and many other parts too that are, are real key drivers. So in addition to you know, our basic collaboration type of suite, also we have uh, really worked towards modernizing our, our own management of our IT service delivery uh, through using SaaS-based tools for replacing our ticket system, uh, you know, continue to improve and automate our processes as we deliver services. Uh, we're working on initiatives now to improve our, our demand forecasting for different service. You know, how we integrate emerging tech into our business portfolios and, and whatnot. So it's, it's definitely a full spectrum effort. Uh, and each component is, is looking at this uh, you know, through their own unique lens, but with the same basic commonalities towards trying to uh, maximize mix mission effectiveness, trying to reduce cost and complexity, um, you know, and definitely capitalizing on, on the, the cloud smart type of strategy. Uh, trying to leverage the investments that are already there and, and all have legacy and on-prem capabilities and integrating those where appropriate with different cloud offerings so that you know we can improve our, our overall service delivery. Got it. Yeah, that's a great overview. I mean, on that demand forecasting piece, mm -hmm. that seems really interesting, probably mm -hmm. pretty integral to what you're going to be doing in the future. Can you talk a little bit more about how you're trying to modernize that process? 
Yeah. So, you know, in the past, <laughs> you know, as you can imagine, I, I think most people, uh, you know, they needed something. They called somebody they knew. Well, things have started moving much too quickly for that. Uh, we really need a, a much more defined process um, with, with clear parameters on how we're going to make decisions about what types of services we're going to deliver and, and in what fashion and you know, the guardrails around it. And certainly uh, we want to focus our, our resources on those requirements that have the most commonality between different customer bases and, and requirements or meet special, unique, uh, highly critical requirements as well. So uh, in moving forward, we're trying to move out of that, that sort of uh, ad hoc type of approach to having a, a more robust requirement gathering process where we catch requirements uh, from our customers and as we're also partnering on different activities and part of that conversation sort of moving up the maturity level, uh, you know, we, we start to see some of the, the needs as they emerge and start to shape different potential options that we could bring to the table and recommending those. So, um, and then, you know, as we go through that, we'll be automating a lot of the, the visibility into that. So dashboarding, capturing customer demand for specific types of capabilities, and then using that to forecast out what we're going to be looking at for follow-on years. Got it. Yeah, that seems pretty crucial to have a high-level understanding of what might be similar needs across the department and, and where you need to have maybe more unique capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and you also mentioned there's, there's some AI applications uh, that are in play today. Uh, mm -hmm. How is that progressing? How, what, what are some specific examples there? Yeah, so we have several uh, AI efforts that are in play right now, uh, especially in the law enforcement community. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, looking at enhanced search options for, for the legal community in terms of uh, you know, managing documents, um, it, it's a huge requirement for us as we're uh, one of the largest uh, law firms, I guess you would say. <laughs> yeah. uh, we definitely have quite a requirement for that. And there are other things that are emerging as, uh, as well. Um, and, and that's really uh, utilizing specific AI tools with our own data sets that we manage uh, to be able to glean those insights and, and help us expedite some of our, our processing. You know, generative IT is obviously, as everyone that is grappl grappling with, a completely different animal. Uh, and so that's, that's going to require a much more uh, concerted effort as we, we really review policy with the rest of the world, frankly. Uh, and make sure that we've got our policy aligned with with use cases and fully understand how that technology works. So we're still a bit off on that, but we're starting to explore the possibilities and, and see what that looks like in the future. Got it. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, probably fair to say that you no know, lawyers at DOJ are going to be using chat GPT to, to generate a legal brief, uh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we may be quite a ways off yeah, on that. Yeah, so. yeah right. Okay, <laughs> yeah. got it. Do you have a rough sense of how many DOJ applications are in the cloud today, and, and uh, as a you know, natural fall into that, how are you kind of rationalizing and prioritizing um, the future kind of number of applications and, and how you work that through at a portfolio mm -hmm. level? Yeah, no, we have quite a few um, yeah. across the spectrum. Um, it, it's a very large percentage. And so, you know, as we look at this, there's also a large hybrid mm. uh, piece to it in terms of uh, moving forward. I think we're gonna end up with uh, still leveraging a lot of on-premise data sources but leveraging different microservices and tools to deliver outcomes. So it's going to be a little more uh, complex at the end of the day. But, but yes, we definitely have quite a bit in the cloud already. Um, and, you know, we have uh, mostly, like I said, those, those mission-focused type of applications and modernized workflows. Uh, we still have quite a few uh, back office functions that we're working to modernize, as, you know, most agencies do. Um, so as we, we hit those particular decision points, uh, from an investment standpoint, we, we regularly review that to say, okay, is this something that we need to target to modernize now? Um, you know, is the technology sufficient that we have now based on, you know, the needs? Or is it time to really look at, you know, maybe replatforming this onto a different offering and or even altering and improving the over, overall and underlying business processes we're using with it? So um, it's definitely a, a, a constantly evolving process as we look at those things. Got it. HR systems and mm -hmm. kind of consulting in the cloud there. You, you mentioned there's some apps that you're looking at right now at DOJ. Anything that you can publicly tell us about, you know, specifically what you're looking at to sort of modernize in that sense? Yeah, I mean, like I say, we're, we're still looking at a lot of uh, back office functions and really it, it, there are a lot of cost decisions that are in play with that. So I don't want to say specifically on that one, but, sure. but uh, definitely um, those are the types of things we're looking at for some of the more traditional uh, business purposes around finance, HR, uh, procurement, and whatnot. But uh, yeah, th this definitely a piece is where we have to weigh, you know, the cost and and the potential benefit as we make those decisions together. 
Uh, yeah, definitely in terms of things that are, are currently moving out rapidly. It's a huge explosion, like I said, in, in ticketing systems, workflow systems, yeah. uh, things that help us move business processes forward. Um, also, uh, tools that we have in place now that we're using in the cloud to help us uh, search for, for documents and, and, and really manage our, our workflows and our tasker requirements. Um, as you can imagine, when we have a, a specific uh, legal matter that we're trying to work through, uh, trying to you know staff that through all the different policy equity holders can be somewhat daunting in an organization of our size. So we're definitely leveraging some more modern tools to help us do that and it's yielding great benefits. Sure, got it. Um, any other uh, specific ways that you'd want to highlight that you know sort of successful digital transformation projects at DOJ and how they've helped you um, perhaps modernize either mission or I know you're looking at back mm-hmm. office functions right now, but any early good examples there that that you want to mention beyond what you've already done? Yeah, so um, some of the things coming up that, that we're really targeting are, are modernizing, you know, the way we look at some of our data visualizations. Okay. Um, you know, that's always a real challenge, you know. How do, we, how do we provide good, you know, decision support to our senior leaders? And so we started looking at some of the more modern tools to do that um, and, you know, potentially creating more of a, a data analytic capability specific to decision support requirements. So that's something that's on our radar um, we're starting to work through that now. We're also looking at modernizing some of our legal matters management processes through the use of SaaS tools. Um, that's something that traditionally has been a, a highly manual process. Uh, we have several litigating components that are in dire need of just uh, you know, really robust functionality due to just the, the massive increase in electronic discovery requirements that are happening. So that's something we're working with some of our partners on now to find you know, the right solutions for that that are going to have the best return on investment and also you know, have a, a, a good degree of, of usability and an easy path to adoption so that we can scale that across multiple components. Because what we've, we've had in the past were um, you know, several uh, requirements that were built out for specific uh, customer requirements. You know, we built a solution for that. And then you know, there would be another similar but slightly different requirement. So what we're trying to do really is, especially in that legal matter space, look at it as a portfolio of different opportunities to, to provide services. And then from that, boil down the certain key building block elements from a tool set standpoint, and then creating those with the eye towards reuse so that we don't have to completely uh, you know, create a whole cloth new solution. Uh, and from that, I think we're going to save a, a lot of money and also a lot of time so that we can fulfill those demands much more quickly than, than in the past. Within all of this, I know it's probably really important to take a, a really customer-centric um, approach to this, a human-centered design is a term you hear all the time. Mm-hmm. How are you doing that at DOJ uh, under these different modernization projects? Yeah, so one of the things we're, we're working through is, is making sure that we have design built into anything with a significant user-facing requirement. Uh, so we're starting off with sort of building a, you know, along a topology teams model um, you know, at least in our internal organization, and we're hoping we can, you know, convince others to, to adopt these types of approaches. And some already are, frankly. But by creating sort of a platform group that works on the platform layer, but then within the application groups, making sure that we have a, a design capability built in, uh, full spectrum, whether it be, uh, you know, the human-centered design, uh, user interface, graphic design, depending on the needs of the project. And that's something we're going to try to build out in a little more uh, capability uh, at, at our enterprise level to provide more of that uh, expertise as time goes on. But that is absolutely critical. If, if the tool doesn't meet usability requirements, it's very difficult to adopt, and then it's hard to reap the benefits of the investment. So it's something we uh, definitely focus on very, very carefully. So with our, our latest uh, main SaaS tool that we're working on, uh, some of our internal management processes, we have designers integrated into that team. Up front, uh, you know, so that we can make sure that that we're really addressing that proactively through each of the sprint cycles for those different uh, efforts. We're going to touch on a workforce a little bit more specifically at at some point in this conversation, but specifically mm-hmm. to design, I know those skills are really in demand. You know, mm-hmm. folks from Silicon Valley, tech companies, um, that those sort of human centered design skills is that something that you have good access to, you have good folks there at DOJ today, you can you know, train folks, uh, upskill folks on that, or do you, is there a gap there at all that you're looking to address? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say along all the technical lines, there's always a, a challenge trying to get talent, right, and yeah. maintaining that talent. We have really good partners that we work with in industry that have been able to furnish us quite a bit of talent in that area. 
Um, as we expand, obviously, we'll, we'll need to, to exercise more options you know, as we get deeper into uh, those capabilities. But uh, it's not just design. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, across the spectrum, we're seeing a, a real challenge uh, attracting top talent and, and keeping top talent across government and really in, in many of the tech fields. Um, you know, so I think that's going to be a, an ever-present challenge. So we're really taking a lot of proactive steps in general uh, for IT hiring uh, to make that more attractive. And you know, just in my experience, having a, a very uh, compelling mission is really important, which we have. Uh, and also having competitive pay, which we have. Uh, having uh, ability to hire directly, which we have, uh, makes it all a lot easier. And we also obviously uh, focus on workplace flexibilities and and all the things that we need for a modern work, workforce. And I think with those combinations, it's gonna really reap a lot of benefits for us over time. And you touched on this early on, in the, or you touched on this throughout the conversation, but I wanted to ask about the, the specific unique challenges when it comes to um, applying modern technologies within law enforcement applications at DOJ. Mm-hmm. I think you said you, know, you have some uh, needs for secure comms, radio comms, mm-hmm. things like that. Uh, this whole idea of extending the enterprise to the edge within mm-hmm. DOJ's different um, law enforcement uh, use cases. What challenges are you seeing there? How are you addressing them? Yeah, so one of the biggest challenges is interoperability. You know, as you can imagine, we're, our, our, our law enforcement agencies are, are constantly collaborating across the full spectrum of organizational types and sizes and, and geographic locations. So uh, interoperability with communications is a, a really big challenge. So uh, we are looking to pilot some opportunities so that we can improve uh, interoperability, especially around the the, uh, the, the piece of uh, uh, radio communications. Uh, it, it's a real challenge, frankly, uh, across the entire organization. Uh, that we have a lot of really great uh, specific point capabilities that are in place, and uh, you know, as we go forward, trying to really create those those smooth paths. To interoperating, I think is going to pay off dividends, but it'll take a bit of an investment up front. So we're working through that now, uh, in projecting out a, a pilot we've identified uh, for 2025. Uh, and we're hoping that as we go forward with that, it'll it'll give us a lot more options uh, to assist our, our other components and, and the rest of law enforcement in, in doing that. Um, and you know, I think as as you can imagine, as as uh, 5G takes off, and uh, you know, you really start to see that boom in edge computing. There's going to be a, a much larger uh, drive even the now uh, to be able to improve the way we share information uh, you know real time sure. and it's just it's going to be a constantly evolving challenge that we're going to be dealing with so as different geographic regions adopt 5g at different speeds we'll definitely be keeping an eye on that and you know we have to make sure that our application layer and our, our you know network layer delivery layer can keep up with that and our, mm. our mobility too so that's where having uh, agnostic uh, tools as much as possible and agnostic devices is going to be critical so that we can really keep pace with a lot of those changes. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, there's there's a lot there. I, wa- I wanted to just ask uh, more specifically about the the pilot project that you're working through now. Will that uh, specifically look at, you know, 5G and, and s- use cases there or what, what more can you tell us about what to watch out for there? Um, it's not so much on the 5G side okay. as it is um, really trying to smooth that path towards interoperability between different communication media. Got it. And that's okay. where um, it's just been a, a real challenge uh, for you know everyone to be able to do that. So uh, really looking forward to that taking off. I think it's going to reap benefits as I said and uh, we have a lot of agency support for that, that program um, and a lot of really good partnerships uh, with industry and you know, with our fellow components. The other aspects or challenge within these different uh, data sharing pieces with law enforcement is, is privacy mm-hmm. and considerations. And you, you got a lot of, I know, things to comply with there. Of course. Um, how, how are you approaching that specifically as you're looking to roll out these modern digital applications? Yeah, no, you're, you're right. Privacy is a, a huge concern, um, you know, that we're, we're highly focused on. So we collaborate very closely uh, you know, with our privacy office, um, all of our different legal components that we deal with, uh, you know, as we, we have any of this emerging technology. So uh, we have a data governance board. We have, and underneath that, there's uh, different boards as well. And we, we make sure that we have tri chairs for each of those boards. And I think that's one of the keys. It's, yes, it's governance, and it's also uh, attempts to really um, circulate some of the, the planning considerations that are required to make good policy. 
And so we make sure that we have a representative from the IT field uh, and also one from the law enforcement side and one from the legal side. So that way, uh, for you know each of the the different emerging technology type of pieces you would you would think of, we make sure that you know we've got the full view uh, of the mission requirement so that we can help policymakers make informed decisions. Um, we also make sure we have our cybersecurity folks obviously heavily engaged and involved in that as well. Um, and you know there's a whole host of different uh, pieces and parts that go with policy and 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 certainly privacy, um, you know diversity, uh, uh, equity and inclusion. Uh, you know, and, and several other things that we're, we're hyper focused on. So, um, you know, we already have a draft policy in the works on, on that for several key areas, especially like around AI uh, that we're working through. So that's, it's an active ongoing conversation um, that, that we make sure we circulate into any of the new emerging tech efforts. Um, so we've got the right controls in place. We've got the right equity holders uh, involved and engaged fully. Uh, so that we make sure that we're meeting all those requirements going forward. Because obviously, as being Department of Justice, we are highly focused on making sure that that we follow follow those those requirements. Right. Yeah. It's in the news immediately if if something uh, happens there. I mean, that draft policy is that that's a draft privacy policy specifically for um, emerging tech or uh, no? That's that's around AI. Around AI specifically. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And around the considerations around using it. So we're really excited to you know as that that stuff moves forward. So there's yeah. there's a lot in that space moving forward. Uh, you know, just excited to to keep pace with it. Actually, do you know if that will be um, made public at some point uh, as a DOJ policy, or will it be that more internal to the department? Uh, I can't I can't speak to that yeah. part. I'm not sure how that's going to evolve over time. I think there'll definitely be some evolutions in that. There will be components of it that I would imagine would be uh, more internally focused. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's it's more uh, in general governing how we use uh, the technology. Uh, but there will be, be certainly some intersections, I think, with the public interest. And where yeah. appropriate, we'll make sure that you know, the public interest is satisfied and all of our notification requirements. Yeah, right. yeah I'm sure. It's, I mean, it's fascinating. I think organizations across the world are working through some sort of AI mm-hmm. privacy policy right now, and DOJ being one of those uh, who, could, who could potentially put theirs out there. That'd be pretty interesting to see, considering all the ins and outs that you, you folks have to work through. I wanted to move into talking about cybersecurity. I know uh, federal agencies are laser focused on this shift to zero trust architectures. Uh, Can you talk about how, you know, DOJ has moved to zero trust and how that's playing out and and the role cloud services plays in that transformation? Sure. Uh, So, yeah, it's definitely a a journey, I think, for for every organization. Uh, And it's an exciting time in the space, frankly, because uh, you know, we view zero trust as one of the largest enablers that's really going to help us towards securely modernizing a lot of our, our needs, you know, as we previously discussed. In terms of the way we looked at it, we really wanted to look at it holistically and provide a, an easy path and actual tools, practical capabilities uh, for all of our components, all of our customers, our partners, our, our community to use uh, in a way that would help make us more secure over time. And we also took sort of a modular approach to it. So the idea that as different tool sets and capabilities evolve throughout the market, we want to be able to bring in and out, you know, different capabilities to fill new requirements as time goes on. Because this has to be a living, breathing, evolving capability. Uh, And, you know, we know that, you know, in the tech world, obviously, every few years there are massive disruptions. So we want to make sure we can adjust to that without, uh, you know, undue strain on the enterprise. So... Um, as we, we did that, we really looked at, you know, coming up with a concept for, you know, what were the, the tools that we wanted to use? And we, our underlying precept of this was that we really wanted to make sure that we lived up to the principles. So wanted to reduce the risk of federation because, you know, when you federate identities, for instance, uh, requires implicit trust, which sort of is uh, the opposite of zero trust, right? We want to make sure that um, we're looking at each thing as it is. Um, and so as we, we looked at that strategy, we really looked at the, the capabilities of bringing in a single identity capability. So we want every user that interacts with our data to have a unique identity. Uh, that, that really paves the way for, for a lot of benefits down the road. And especially as we move to cloud, um, you know, and the reliance on, on physical networks reduces, that identity sort of becomes the quasi-network, if you will, of, of the past. That's really how we're going to know who's interacting with our data, um, where they're going is going to tell us, you know, where our data is uh, in many respects. And from that, I'm really speaking in a distributed cloud model. 
um, you know, and as things evolve, we really want to make sure that we have a firm handle on who that, that user is um, and that we validate that identity and that, you know, they're able to access the appropriate levels of data correctly uh, throughout our enterprise. Um, also, uh, within that, we wanted to make sure that, you know, we had a capability to, to really understand what's happening on our endpoints. Uh, so that was a, a really critical point. So, you know, having a, a robust EDR capability uh, was super critical to us. Uh, and then in addition, you know, understanding that as things are evolving, a lot more access is happening, you know, to cloud environments. We wanted a much more uh, modern approach to connecting to those environments. Uh, you know, the traditional network environment and having specific VPNs to every environment is just rather onerous. Uh, so we, we basically have created uh, uh, different product offerings of commercially available tools with our configuration sets on top of it and uh, made sure that we've got those capabilities in place. Uh, we piloted those, so we've, we've piloted the, the EDR capability and our uh, cloud identity uh, capability and our uh, connectivity capability as well. Um, and now we've come out of that, that piloting stage with some great lessons learned, you know, really practical understanding from working with actual um, use of these tools at scale of across many components, so you know, the full breadth of representative use cases. Uh, to make sure that we, we hit all those major requirements and didn't leave anything out, uh, leave anything to chance on that. And so now as we're rolling out of that pilot phase, we're now rolling into full implementation. Um, we've already made significant inroads in our, our EDR implementation. Frankly, we're, we're almost complete with that, uh, which is great. Um, the next big step is really moving out on our, our identity solution. So we've made quite a few inroads into that. Um, I believe we've got about 60 applications that are already uh, integrated with that solution. There will be more coming. Our main uh, email collaboration suite integration will be happening in the fall. Uh, we still have some technical things on the tool side we have to work through based on our environment. Uh, but conceptually, I think we've got everything else lined up for that. Uh, and in addition to that, we'll also be integrating our, our cloud connectivity, our, our cloud broker. Um, and that's going to really help us uh, going forward. So we'll be able to take threat intelligence and information from endpoints from our EDR solution, integrated with what we know from our identity tool, and um, that's all going to converge, you know, in our in our business rule engine, uh, you know, coming back from uh, the the connectivity side, knowing where people are going. So with that, we're going to be able to have unprecedented capability uh, to really understand our users' behavior. Um, and integrate threat behaviors and, and risk into you know, our access rules and be able to, to control what folks are, are accessing in which way, um, in a way that we just haven't been able to do before. So we're, we're quite excited about it. Uh, we've got a lot of groundswell support for that. Still a lot of challenges to work out, um, a lot of change management that has to happen, of course. So this is, like I said, a journey, uh, but we're well on our way. Yeah, wow, I, uh, that's quite the overview. I was trying to keep up with all my notes here. You know, I wanted to follow up the the uh, single identity capability. Can you talk a little bit more uh, about, about what that is specifically? And is this, you know, DOJ employees? Is this all like users, public facing and internal? Right, so cloud-based uh, identity solution, um, yeah. common commercially available tool. Um, and, you know, the, the value of that is that it's got built-in API connectors, so we can connect to uh, different applications very rapidly. And it is for all of our internal users and uh, also our external users as well, so non-DOJ users that will be interacting with our data. Um, obviously, there, there's a, a journey in that in terms of where we draw that line at what phase because we have quite a few external users. So we're going to phase that through just from a, a budgetary projection standpoint. Uh, but from a... a, a a use case standpoint, yeah, the intent is to have all of our, our users under that, that umbrella. Um, we have quite a few users that need to um, share uh, information between different organizations within DOJ and the interagency. So it's absolutely critical that we have that capability in place to know, you know specifically who that single user is, what their identity is, what they're, they're able to access. Uh, and then you know, as they, they traverse the different uh, IT environments throughout the organization and the interagency, uh, you know, we can apply the appropriate controls to that access. Got it. And you know, how did you work through some of the different challenges that are inherent with identity when it comes to user attributes, multi-factor authentication, capabilities, categories? How, how did that work? Or how does that work? 
Yeah, so really what we're doing on the RBAC side, so the role-based access controls, is we're, we're letting the, uh, the application owners really manage their different roles because we have so many applications out there. Right. Hard to do that centrally. Um, but we're providing the path for the identity on the authentication. So um, as they do that, and there are other tools we're using in conjunction with this to assist as well. So um, with that, we can provide a more holistic capability, but we still need to make sure that we leave plenty of room for the application owner that's closer to their business users to be able to manage that user community. So for instance, as we're rolling this tool out, uh, you know, there's a lot of concern on, well, how are you going to actually manage that? And so, um, you know, obviously, you know, we have thousands of applications out there now, really not realistic to pull all that provisioning uh, requirement back to a central location. So uh, once again, that shared responsibility model, um, we're giving delegated rights to, you know, our, our component IT shops to be able to interact with provisioning uh, directly with their user base for applications. So all of that basic, you know, tier one, tier two support. Uh, we can continue on as it was. We're, we're really, the, the difference is we're doing it all in the same tool and the same architecture. And that's the real game changer without shifting work, if you will. Um, and with that, we're able to satisfy all the equities uh, you know, throughout the enterprise without you know, too much disruption. There are a couple of use cases that we're still working through that have some unique challenges just because of uh, the way they've evolved some of their requirements. Um, but ultimately, you know, everything's going to fit under that architecture. Got it. All right. And so EDR is, is almost complete. And then you mentioned the cloud broker. Uh, that integration is, is coming down mm -hmm. the line as well. Uh, yes. any, anything more to watch out for there on the cloud broker specifically? Yeah, like I said, I mean, we're, we're going to be integrating that with our identity tool with our main collaboration suite. So with that, we'll capture uh, most of the users in the community, uh, which I think is going to be very helpful. So definitely a large change management lift. Um, you know, there are things we have to ask our users to do, so we'll be prepared to help them through that. And it's super critical. I, I don't want to, I don't want to understate, you know, the challenges in change management. And I think sometimes as IT folks, we often forget that, you know, there's somebody on the other side of that screen that we really need to make sure we're in tune with. So uh, to that end, you know, we're developing our engagement material, our communications material, our, our strategy on how we're going to help users through that change. Uh, and, you know, once they get used to it, it will become fairly standard and routine. Uh, but there's always that initial change we have to work through. Sure. Got it. Moving on to uh, just enhancing cloud security in general. How, how are you kind of, you know, authorizing, I'm sure you obviously use FedRAMP mm -hmm. and monitoring the um, security of your data in these different cloud services? Yeah, so definitely we use uh, FedRAMP as a, a real underlayment for our compliance requirements. Uh, it's absolutely critical, and it, it's been a great partnership uh, you know, over the years. Uh, they've really helped us, uh, it will help the whole government in terms of you know, cutting through some of the, the duplication of effort that would potentially be out there uh, to be able to get a firm understanding of the state of uh, the design and operation of, of security controls within the different cloud uh, providers. Um, so, you know, uh, frankly, uh, we've seen a, a huge spike and an increase in the number of cloud requests for different tools. But commensurate to that, I think FedRAMP's done a really great job of, of expediting, you know, the 3PAO review process. Um, you know, it's challenging, and I know vendors are, are constantly challenged with it, and it's costly. But at the end of the day, it yields us a lot of uh, reuse in terms of compliance documentation and understanding that uh, just really helps ease that bar to adoption uh, for different agencies. Uh, so really, we, we focus on making sure that we've got FedRAMP authorizations for all of our vendors uh, that we work with for cloud offerings where we don't and where the need is critical enough to our, and unique enough to our, our, our business need, uh, we do sometimes sponsor, you know, provide ATO sponsorships uh, for those cloud providers. And that's also a really great partnership opportunity as we work with them. And, you know, it also helps us provide and helps the vendors provide, uh, you know, those capabilities more widely throughout the government. So we value that partnership, um, really getting a lot out of that, that shared uh, experience. So, um, in addition, you know, it, it, it helps us reduce the time that it takes, obviously, to, to get our ATOs. Um, and that goes in line with our, our kind of shared responsibility model we do with cloud as well, or we're working through here with cloud, um, where, you know, we can provide some of those ser services centrally, uh, you know, to add additional controls on top of that, that cloud provider layer uh, so that the application owner has fewer controls they have to manage. Um, and that really helps speed adoption. We've seen that, you know, quite, be quite successful. Um, I think it will continue to be. So yeah, FedRAMP is just absolutely integral. So uh, 
you know, definitely uh, encouraging continued partnership there. Got it. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, it helps with reuse. I, I often hear that, you know, there's components who often believe that they have to do their own assessment or get their own assessment because they don't necessarily trust what some other component in government has done already. Do you have that problem at DOJ? Are you working through that at all? Or is that something that you've, a cultural thing that maybe you've, you've gotten through? I, I think for the most part, uh, I, I would say most of our, our our partners have worked through a lot of those those initial challenges. Um, we do have some unique, uh, you know, legal requirements that make us look at cloud a little differently for some parts of the organization, and that's fine. Um, I think for the majority um, that that have fairly standard use cases, I, I don't think that's much of a, a concern anymore. I, I think the the real challenge now is you know how to how to really rapidly fuel that adoption. And a, a lot of components are trying to figure out, you know, how do they get the right talent in? How do they line up the right capabilities um, to have that outcome as, as rapidly as possible? Um, so I, I think that's definitely uh, on the upswing. Got it. And uh, you, you mentioned uh, the shared responsibility model and providing mm -hmm. some centralized capabilities uh, from headquarters. What, what's the status of that kind of uh, conversation? And, mm -hmm. and, and can you tell us a little bit more about how that's working today? Right. So we're already doing that with, you know, our, our main... Uh, collaboration suite of related applications. Um, and we're about to roll that out with some of our cloud IaaS environments. Um, mm -hmm. We basically got the, the controls in place, the ATOs in place. We're working through an initial pilot with one of our key uh, business customers to make sure that we get the right flavor of support um, that's gonna resonate well uh, with the folks that need to manage their workloads in those environments. Um, we're also uh, gonna do that with uh, you know, one of our, our SaaS platforms uh, in the next few months. So we've got the platform built out. Uh, we have some immediate needs to do internally that, that we have uh, application projects for. And then we'll be rolling that out more broadly as a platform service that other folks can can take advantage of if they need to do ticketing and, and workflows and that sort of thing. So, um, and we're gonna look at continuing to evolve that through you know all the new platforms that we have um, and are rolling out to, to have that view of, is this something that we could offer economically as, as an extra service. So the idea is that um, we can take that, that basic environment, add a platform layer where we already integrate the identity piece from zero trust and you know, uh, logging uh, connectivity and some of the baseline provisioning requirements uh, you know, to allow the, the application owners to get to work much more quickly. And obviously that'll vary based on the different cloud platform type because they have different control sets and management planes and whatnot. But, but that's the idea, so that instead of having to spin up and manage the entire platform soup to nuts, you know, a customer can come and say, well, I have this need, um, I need development space and production, and we can help them get provisioned, and then um, give them some best practice and obviously help them along the way, but, but at the end of the day, they'll be able to manage that workload or that application layer within that platform uh, while inheriting a, a lot of uh, controls they would have had to have put in place themselves. Um, a lot of the integrations that are, you know, sort of, uh, you know, helpful at an enterprise level would already be there for them. Um, also, a big component of this is using enterprise license agreements so that they don't have to go through their own separate procurements. They can just use ours. So with all that, we're helping, hoping to, to really speed adoption um, and a lot of the replatforming needs that are constantly, you know, emerging as people, as I talked about earlier, are, are making those reinvestment decisions on, you know, uh, what do I want to do now, now that I've gotten to a certain decision point. Uh, in that technology. We touched on it earlier. You talked about the workforce uh, mm -hmm. challenges in the IT workforce in general, not just mm -hmm. necessarily human-centered design, but cybersecurity otherwise. Uh, you know, does DOJ have uh, an approach for kind of dealing with those recruitment, retention challenges, those pay challenges? You mentioned you've got a mission that's pretty uh, inspiring for some mm -hmm. folks to want to come join, but what are some of the ways that you're trying to bridge those other gaps? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and like I said, the, the mission piece is super critical. Um, you know, having that, that exciting mission that, you know, attracts folks uh, definitely helps because it is a competitive market. And I, I just can't, I can't understate that. Um, yeah, so as we move forward with that, you know, from, you know, we obviously have quite a bit of, uh, you know, contract labor. So we're, we're trying to make sure that we're partnering with really good companies that, that have the reach back and the capability to get top talent. Uh, and then on the government side, we're trying to make sure that, you know, as we hire and we, 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 we look for the right folks, we're, we're clear about the types of skill sets that, that we're looking for. 
uh, and then we're offering them opportunities that will be compelling for them as well. Uh, and you know, certainly, you know, in the, in the hiring process piece, we've been working very closely with our, our HR team in the department, and they've just made amazing progress in terms of reducing time to hire, um, assisting uh, with recruitment processes, um, streamlining where they can, while still obviously maintaining all of the legal requirements they have for the hiring process. Um, but in doing that, we've been able to rapidly increase our, our staffing, you know, certainly in our organization. Uh, and more broadly, I think we're going to be looking for additional opportunities out there to, to really be competitive with pay um, and, you know, and, and the hiring process itself, trying to be as rapid as possible, uh, obviously, while still you know, meeting those needs uh, for the competitive process uh, involved. But we're definitely moving in the right direction. Um, I think one of the, the challenges that we're all going to be grappling with is, you know, where do we, where do we find the, the best people? Uh, what are the, the best sources to look for for, for talent? And that's shifting and evolving all the time. So we're always on the lookout for new potential uh, uh, places to look, you know. And, and certainly we have our, our public um, types of uh, you know advertisements, but we're also looking for you know uh, relationship built type uh, engagement. So you know where where can we we find folks that have these skills, uh, you know, across government, uh, across industry, and uh, and make sure they understand the opportunities that we have available for them. As there's been some layoffs in the tech sector over the past, mm -hmm. you know, six months, a year, and there is some discussion that that could potentially be a place where uh, government looks mm -hmm. to pull from. Is are you finding that, or is that? Yes, yeah. actually, yeah. I'm. Uh, I'm reviewing interviews today from uh, several uh, folks from tech companies, and it, it is definitely something I'm noticing. Um, there are a lot of talented folks from the tech industry that are, are reaching out looking for government jobs. Uh, and that's an exciting thing to see, that cross-pollination. Um, and I, I think it's one of those things where, you know, as government managers, we'll have to make sure that we're, we're attuned to what's happening in the market uh, and looking at what's happening in that broader labor market. And certainly those, those shifts in the tech industry are going to be a great opportunity, I think, for government to find, you know, top talent that's fully engaged in, in modern practices and approaches and really has that, that deep knowledge of, of cloud and emerging tech to bring to bear uh, you know, as we, we kind of build out our teams. Uh, and it's also important, too, that, you know, internally as, as government uh, managers, supervisors, executives, that, that we really think through how do we, we make sure that we're maintaining or, or, if need be, creating a workplace that's really going to help, uh, you know, bring out the best skill set. So making sure that we have agile practices in place and the tools we need to help people operate in an agile way. Um, that we're, we're breaking some of those barriers to communication, you know, silos that you always hear about in any large organization, not specific to government, but making sure that we've got real strong inroads from a process standpoint um, and a leadership standpoint that, that really enables and drives that communication and that rapid, agile-based delivery. Um, and that's going to help us ma maintain those, uh, those talented folks uh, in those positions that we bring in. Well, one thing I wanted to make sure I asked you about before we uh, leave this off is uh, what vendors should know about working with your office and perhaps with DOJ more broadly? Yeah, I would say um, at, at a high level, definitely that, uh, you know, we, we're we not looking for, you know, one solution to rule them all, all right? There, there's, there's always going to be a, you know, a, a multi-vendor uh, approach for most things. Uh, and really, I think, frankly, any organization that has such a wide breadth and depth of requirements um, and disparate business needs is going to have to have uh, multiple uh, approaches from a, a tool set standpoint to solve a problem. So um, in addition, uh, vendor lock-in is something, you know, every, every agency is very conscious of and concerned about. So, you know, as vendors come and engage with us, we're really looking for uh, tools that will help us meet our mission uh, and also offer us the flexibility as, you know, conditions change, requirements change, to be able to adjust accordingly you know, to meet our needs. Uh, it's super critical. And of course, uh, usability is huge. So anything with a facing component, uh, we're hyper-focused on, you know, how easy is it for people to adopt? How, how well does it, it fit the requirements of the people doing the work? Are they going to be able to easily understand uh, those capabilities or is it going to be difficult to, to do that change management, you know, from a facing standpoint? And I think from an infrastructure standpoint, uh, things have got to be, you know, API driven. We've got to be able to share and integrate easily uh, with different tools. So, for instance, our, our suite of ZTA, uh, zero trust architecture tools, they absolutely have to be able to integrate with all of those. 
Um, so, you know, moving forward, we're, we're really looking for that, that flexibility and that modernization uh, capacity in any of the tools that we, we select. Got it. Great considerations there. Well, uh, again, I'd like to thank today's guest, Brian Merrick, the Deputy Director of Service Delivery Staff at the Justice Department. Brian, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Justin. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm your moderator, Justin Doubleday, and you're watching Federal News Network. Now let me send you back to the studio for more on the cloud exchange.